time for epic adventures in Pokemon X and Pokemon Y. Explore a vast region filled with Pokemon to catch, train and befriend. Select your team from hundreds of Pokemon. Test your trainer skills in exciting battles and unleash amazing powers. It's time for Pokemon X and Y, exclusive to the Nintendo 3DS family. I wish I could tell you I liked Pokemon X and Y. I want to sit here and explain to you that they've been judged too harshly, that they deserve their spot in the limelight. I would love to be Kalos's champion. Unfortunately, I'm not in the business of lying. X and Y was the point at which a franchise already struggling to meet its deadlines would catapult into 3D development, increasing its cost and scope without the extra time or resources necessary to land that jump. Every single 3D Pokémon developed by Game Freak is plagued by one major issue or another in an attempt to keep the world's most lucrative money-printing machine running. It's a tough pill to swallow, but often the success of a creative franchise under capitalism means that it will slowly be stripped of what made it special to begin with. In the pursuit of profit, what a work aims to say is drowned out by the potential of its pull as a monetary asset. More than has ever been true of Pokémon before, each new generation has become ever more fleeting. What should have been the most exciting generation in the franchise is instead my most forgettable. I played Pokemon X once when it came out and never again. Despite waiting for the midnight release with a friend, getting the themed 3DS XL alongside it, and meeting Chespin, my favorite starter, I remembered next to nothing about Kalos when returning to it for this video. I thought maybe this would be a blessing, that I would come back to the region with a fresh perspective and develop a newfound appreciation for it. This didn't happen. I'm sorry. I tried. It's time to skate into Kalos, the region of beauty for which my flame burns faintly. Mega Evolution! Mega Powerful! When holding a Mega Stone, select Pokémon have the power to Mega Evolve! Don't miss the special Torchic distribution that begins on October 12th. Torchic comes with a Mega Stone, Blaziken that can't be obtained through normal play. Evolve Torchic into Blaziken and then trigger Mega Evolution. Take your Pokémon to the next level! I do not envy the impossible task Game Freak had here. Every Pokémon needs a 3D model, and since this is a franchise that allows you to transfer up every single monster in existence, for now, that means all 719 of them. They all need a standing animation, attack animations, the whole kit and caboodle. To their credit, they were able to pull this off in the short time they had, but I want you to think about that number again. 719. Not just any models, mind you. Models for the main selling point, the thing that you need to get right above all else. Then, I want you to think about how long it took to develop these games. Jinichi Masuda, Game Freak's director at the time, posted on his blog that the project took three and a half years. We can infer from this that development started somewhere in 2010, around the time Black and White released. In between that time, Black 2 and White 2 also released. If I were to make a realistic prediction, the whole of Game Freak's creative staff were not working on the next new Pokémon game, at least not the entire time. They had to keep up their consistent flow of releases. Which means that a heavily compromised team of over 80 people working on several different projects at once, including titles like Harmonite and Pocket Cart Jockey, had to somehow cobble together that much content in a relatively short period of time. It probably won't surprise you that they're not all created equal. Typhlosion is the classic example. His mane isn't shooting out fire by default, so he tends to look very... naked. It's unsettling. Flying Pokémon are all in flight by default to accommodate the new sky battles, so a lot of them have to glide there awkwardly in very similar poses. Snorlax no longer lays on his back, he just sort of... stands there. Epowdon no longer has his sand to accompany him, and it just looks... wrong. Sprites could be staged much more creatively, as they're much simpler to work with. 2D art tends to be a lot more expressive, allowing you to fill in certain details that would be much harder to depict in a 3D space. You have more control over perspective, 
There's nothing you necessarily need to consistently animate. Hippowdon could be covered in sand in 2D because that sand didn't have to move in the way that you'd expect it to in real life. You could take a snapshot of a Pokémon's core essence and just leave it there. X and Y are trying to adapt creatures which were created to play to the strengths of a two-dimensional plane, all under the gun of a rather strict timer. That's likely why we went from 150 new Pokémon in black and white to 69 in X and Y. If you're someone who likes to revisit these games to build new teams like I am, there are a dire lack of options here. It's not to say these Pokémon are horrible, each new generation always has its standouts. Aegislash is a phenomenal design, a sentient sword and shield with an attack and defense mode. Its Pokedex entry states that generations of kings were attended by these Pokémon, which used their spectral power to manipulate and control people in Pokémon. Apparently, it can detect the innate qualities of leadership. According to legend, whoever it recognizes is destined to become king. This is a perfect fit for a region with a royal presence. Pancham, Phantump, and Chespin are constantly battling it out for my heart. Chespin in particular is a beautiful ball of sunshine, and I will not tolerate slander of my baby boy. He evolves into a spiky bowling ball, and then into a big knight with a spiky shield on his back. Fits the aesthetic theme of the starter trio quite well as the tank role. Clawitzer is a pretty dope concept, modeled after a long-range artillery cannon called the Howitzer. Tyrantrum is my favorite fossil Pokémon, Talonflame is one of my favorite regional birds, Gudra used to kind of freak me out, but the little goof has grown on me. I think the need to make Xerneas and Eviltal look like the letters X and Y is a bit silly, but I've always admired their place in the region's lore. For the region of beauty, where we marvel at the nature of all things, we have the legendary duo represent life and death itself. Xerneas, who awakens from a years-long slumber to grant eternal life, and Eveltal, who sucks in all life that surrounds it until it transforms into a cocoon upon death. They embody the essence of existence. Unfortunately, I've forgotten that a lot of them even exist. Diggersby, Vivalon, Aromates, the more I scroll through the list, the more I realize that there are so few to choose from. This was a problem when I was trying to construct a team for my playthrough of X, because my Kalos options were frustratingly limited. Greninja has always seemed pretty cool to me. He's easily the fan favorite starter, and I've never personally gotten to use him, so that was an easy pick for my starter, even if it was a little boring. You need a flying type for the newly introduced sky battles, and since I wanted a fire type that wasn't Pyroar, that meant I was picking up Talonflame. I didn't want to use Tyrantrum again like my original playthrough, so I gave Aurorus a shot instead. Shame that it was easily the worst member of my team, especially because I really do appreciate its design. I picked up Klefki out of sheer curiosity, since I never hear anything about it other than it being the poster child for what's wrong with modern Pokémon designs. Prankster is a very helpful ability, giving its status moves priority, and it was such a clutch asset to the team that it got me to further investigate its Pokédex entries where I kind of fell in love with the little dude. It states that these key collectors threaten any attackers by fiercely jingling their keys at them. I don't even have to imagine what this would look like, because they reflected that entry in its attack animation, where it quite literally convulses in front of whatever it's fighting. Just the idea of a Klefki going up against Arceus or something by jingling its keys rapidly is amazing. What a trooper. Trevenant was a fun pick, though I do wish I got to play around with its hidden harvest ability. Still, slapping uh, leftovers on it, setting up Leech Seed, using Horn Leech for recovery, and Phantom Force for more turns of healing was a really fun playstyle. Gudra rounded out the team nicely, adding the usual perks you'd expect from a dragon type. I've thought about what I might do if I ever decided to revisit X and Y, and I'd probably just have to use returning Pokémon to make a halfway interesting team. I can tell you the team I'd try to make. Delphox, Klotzer, Dragalki, Pangoro, Gorgeist, and Florgus. This team inspires no passion in me whatsoever, but it was about the best I could come up with. After this, I would then be out of Kalos Pokémon that I care even a little about. Obviously, this makes sense. I am going to run out of Kalos Originals, eventually. But the low count of new Pokémon ensures that with only two playthroughs in my entire life, I have almost run out of options that I care about, which has never been true before. It's a genuine problem with X and Y's identity, practically built on the back of the past. Coming off one of the most original generations of Pokémon to ever exist, which limited you to new mons and its regional decks, 
These games do the exact opposite, giving you a second set of starters from the first generation upon reaching Lumios City. You're incentivized to use two sets of starters on your team. Pandering to nostalgia is a smart business move for sure. People want to see their favorite mons return, and I think in some ways that is an important element to the franchise's continued success. I would never say that I don't want my old favorites to return. That'd be silly. Yet, this is also one of the reasons I have struggled to form a strong connection to X and Y. My original team when I played all those years ago consisted of Chestnut, Tyrantrum, Gengar, Blaziken, Lapras, and Scizor. I was so overwhelmed with the past that I only used two new Pokémon. It's no wonder most of them faded from my memory. Part of that is because the game's big new mechanic, Mega Evolution, is centered solely on the past. I remember reading the Koro Koro leaks and initially thinking they had straight up added a fourth stage to evolution. It isn't as crazy as that. It's more like a Super Saiyan transformation. Specific Pokémon can hold a stone that allows them to transcend the boundaries of evolution, and this is likely another reason why there are fewer new Pokémon, since Mega Evolutions may as well be their own. X and Y introduced 30 of these, though three of them were event exclusive, and I basically associate them with the Gen 3 remakes anyway, so for the sake of this discussion we'll focus on the other 27. It's funny to look back at these with the benefit of hindsight. This was the most exciting part of X and Y, the thing they focused on the most when marketing it, and now all of these forms have completely disappeared. It's hard for me to muster up a lot of passion for them these days as a result, and honestly when I look back on a lot of these forms, it's a fairly mixed bag. Mega Charizard X is one of my favorites, incorporating its shiny color scheme and giving it blue flames. It is so much cooler than Mega Charizard Y that it still baffles me it even has two forms to begin with. I really like how Mega Mewtwo Y brings Mewtwo even closer in design to the Pokémon it was copied from, giving it a smaller, sleeker shape. Once again makes me wonder why the X version even exists. These designs tend to work best when they feel like either a fourth stage evolution or a side grade. Mega Alakazam feels like a logical extension to the wise Psychic Sage, in this form having reached even further enlightenment. Mega Lucario's changes are more subtle, but add an even more menacing aura to an already sick design. The hints of red and grown out fur make him feel like a more experienced martial artist. Mega Gengar is even more terrifying, calling back to Haunter, becoming less defined, more corporeal. He's shooting out of the ground now, towering over anyone foolish enough to defy him. Also, why is his shiny infinitely cooler in this form? Base shiny Gengar is so boring, I don't understand this. These designs all feel purposeful, and in my opinion, they only add to the spirits of their origins. They're very raw, enough to justify the prestige of a Mega Evolution. In wanting to use this as a marketing tool though, they did end up picking a lot of already popular Pokémon, which is a problem. Blastoise already had a perfect design, big tortoise with water cannons. It's really hard for me to envision a cooler version of this, because what they came up with sucks. He has more cannons now. Blastoise, but more. Gyarados is one of the series' most iconic designs, and his mega evolution sees him turn into… this thing. He bulks up, he has huge wings, the red spots look more like giant pimples that are about to burst. He just looks like a puffy doof. Aerodactyl has more rocks on his body, I guess? Mega Tyranitar has more spikes jutting out that are much longer and it looks horrible, like he's wearing oversized armor. Mega Agron has a similar problem. When you look at a Pokémon that's really popular, part of the reason they're so popular is because they feel complete. Sure, there are one or two cases I've outlined where they were able to create a form that complements their base form, but even then, I still prefer base form Charizard or base form Mewtwo, and I outright think most of them are a downgrade, which is I think where they shot themselves in the foot, since conceptually, Mega Evolution is about transcending limits. They're about taking already perfect designs and trying to make them even more perfect, which is a fool's errand. Absol, my favorite Pokémon, was one of the privileged few to get a Mega Evolution. You'd think I'd be psyched about it, but I'm not. I loved Absol for what it was, this perfect mix of majestic and mysterious. There's a darkness to him, a foreboding presence, the horn on his forehead inviting a hint of fear. His Mega Evolution is that he gets floofy and grows wings. I didn't need this. Another thing is that popular Pokémon tend to be pretty powerful, and Mega Evolution raises your stats. 
Pokemon that would already be all-stars in previous games have been made even stronger. Lucario was already strong, so when it Mega Evolves, its base stat total raises by 100 points, meaning that it now qualifies as a legendary. That fits the theme of a mega evolution, something that transcends the natural process of evolution, but it also means that I don't have much interest in using these forms. It would feel too much like an instant win button. I'm torn on it overall, as even though most of these designs rub me the wrong way, the concept of mega evolution is so cool. I love the animation that plays when you activate it, and I've always been curious to see where they could have taken this idea if it were to stick around as a permanent addition. Ultimately though, I feel like they ended up gutting it when they likely realized that it was a superfluous addition. They were created to fit a larger theme of beauty, seeing what once was transformed into something entirely new. I don't think they thought beyond the scope of Kalos much. I will say, it was a good time to introduce the fairy type. It was introduced to bring balance to the type chart, as it would be immune to the dragon type whilst becoming its new weakness. This felt pretty necessary, as with each passing generation, more and more dragon types were introduced. It used to only be Dragonite, but as of the fifth generation, most legendaries shared it as a dual typing, almost every pseudo had it, and it had gotten a little out of hand. I understand the desire to bring fairy types in before things spiraled out of control, though it is funny to me that they had to introduce an entirely new type instead of just... I don't know, not making every Ice-type Pokémon the worst. This was far more of a retroactive change than one intended for new Pokémon. The Floet line was the poster child for the new type, but it was also given to Pokémon like Slurpuff, the new Eeveelution, Sylveon, Dedenne, Klefki, and Xerneas. It was meant to house a lot of whimsical, cute Pokémon. And so, in a pretty huge change, the type had more of an impact on returning Pokémon. It tended to replace the normal types that were only given the type out of obligation. Pokémon like Clefable, Wigglytuff, Mr. Mime, Togekiss, Granville, and Gardevoir. In retrospect, these mons really needed a stronger, unifying type, and it actually felt weird to look at their old types while playing the older games now that I'm so used to them. It's surprising how natural the integration of the fairy type feels given that the last time this happened was the second generation. Maybe it's because it fits the vibe of the overall region inspired by France. It is a visually striking region. Its cities are gorgeous, with an assortment of flowers, castles, museums, and cafes. There's a relaxing feel to the whole ordeal, reinforced by an easygoing pace and overall sense of difficulty. You're encouraged to spend your time in the various cafes, chatting up the locals, learning more about the places you visit. You're meant to visit clothing stores, customize your player avatar, and create a fashion that is entirely your own. If you pick the girl, anyway. The options for the boy trainers might as well not exist. You have an invisible style meter, which is affected by the things you do. You're barred access from certain boutiques and hairstylists if this meter isn't filled enough. You raise your style by listening to audio guys at the museum, getting your fur fru styled, or even working part-time at a fancy hotel. You're rewarded for being a tourist. Sure wish this place wasn't such a mess, maybe it would have been more fun to spend time in. They built Lumios as an analog to Paris. It's in the middle of Kalos and you circle around it, returning to it at various points. You're meant to explore it piecemeal, but the way that it's constructed is extremely confusing. The camera is shoved right behind you at all times, every alleyway looks exactly the same, and since it's a giant circle, it's very easy to get lost. I think the camera is a really big reason it feels so disorienting. Had they opted for a top-down perspective instead, it probably would have been a bit more manageable. I suppose, in that sense, it reflects the feeling of being a tourist. You're at the mercy of these huge locations, and it's up to you how much time you spend there. I'd say one of the more enjoyable parts of X and Y was soaking in the sights and sounds. Going from the stone-paved roads and grasslands to the mountainous cliff sides overlooking the beach was cool. There are a lot of visually striking locations supported by a beautiful soundtrack. I don't think it's quite on the serenity level of Generation 4, but some of the route and city themes have stuck with me in a big way. I adore Anastar City, the big sculpture at its center, how it's built over the water, the hint of falling snow paired with the music. It sounds like something out of Klonoa, something out of a dream. Comarine City has some light jazz going on, a relaxing seaside vibe. Shalor City feels like a mystical place, home to the Tower of Mastery. 
Sometimes I'd just sit in the gates that connected cities and routes because the music was just so good. There are some more epic selections, but I tend to enjoy the slower, more down-to-earth stuff like this. The battle-focused stuff tends to feel pretty repetitive. The gym leader theme is decent, but I get a little sick of hearing it after a while. That complaint extends to the Team Flare battle theme, which makes fighting a bunch of their grunts in a row even more exhausting. It lacks the gravitas of previous generations, bordering on the edge of forgettable. The Elite Four theme just sounds like a slightly worse version of the black and white theme. Hell, Deantha's theme feels like a worse version of Iris's theme from Black 2 and White 2. I suppose it doesn't help that Deantha has the personality and presence of a wet paper bag. Finally, a champion who I like less than Lance. What an achievement. At least she doesn't cheat with her team building, I guess. There's your annual Lance dig. No, I will never give up this bit. For as much as Kalos bills itself as a tourist attraction, it still surprises me that HMs weren't canned. There's still a massive obstacle to creating a sense of explorative flow. The region toys with the idea of rideable Pokémon that can do similar things to HMs, yet defaults back to them as a means of travel and progression gating anyway. Perhaps they thought the level design would suffer if you could fully complete routes on your first visit, that it would kill any motivation a player would have to run through the region again. Never mind the fact that a core reason to return to these areas would be to find Pokémon, the core appeal of the game. I simply do not think the rush of dopamine you get from finally unlocking Surf outweighs the disappointment you feel when you can't fully explore a cave because there's a waist-high rock in the way. Generally, the way levels are designed feels too faithful to the series' roots. The act of running around is enhanced by the roller skates you now have, which even have a momentum system you need to manage, and as fun as they are to play around with, these areas are not built for them. They're narrow and filled with obstacles, so for a long time I didn't even know there was a system of momentum to play around with. Kalos is crying for something even more extravagant, a series of routes that aren't locked to a grid. For as much as the franchise is clearly trying to rid itself of dead weight, to evolve, it hasn't quite loosened the anchor around its neck. As we will come to see, it leaves this generation feeling rather formulaic. Last night, I dreamed of all new Pokemon. I dreamed of an amazing new region to explore. I dreamed of new ways to battle. I dreamed of awesome new legendary Pokemon. You can experience Pokemon like never before. It's Pokemon X and Pokemon Y. Playable on Nintendo 3DS and 2DS. Rated E for everyone. Pokemon has a unique relationship with difficulty. Based on the monsters you decide to use, you will experience unique struggles. That's how it's always been. On the whole, I think they have, up until this point, offered an okay level of challenge across the board. You at least need a halfway competent team to make it through them. Gym leaders sometimes keep a varied team with decent coverage. It is very true that a few of them fall victim to being sweeped by a single type. But as the series went on, I think this became ever more difficult to pull off. For those of us who trudge through the weeds of competitive Pokemon or are generally familiar enough with its inner workings, yeah, we're gonna plow through them fairly easily. It is a series built to accommodate everyone. Having said that, X and Y exist in their own dimension of simplicity. I was struck by the magnitude of this while fighting Corina, the third gym leader. Let's think about the most recent fighting type gym leader before her. Maylene uses Meditite, Machoke, and Lucario. She has access to normal, fighting, ground, steel, rock, and psychic type moves to cover most of her weaknesses. Ghosts can't completely wall her, flying types will meet some resistance, and I suppose the worst you can say is she's lacking dark type moves to fight back against ghost and psychic types. She's a decent leader that I could see giving certain team comps some trouble. Karina uses Mianfu, Machoke, and Halucha. For some reason, they each only have three moves, which is absurd on the face of it. But those moves only consist of fighting and rock type attacks. Two of her Pokemon only have fighting type attacking moves, which means they cannot attack ghost types, period. You bring, oh, I don't know, a Hone Edge, one of the premier ghost types, and she'll be putty in your hands. Now, you might be saying, okay, but Chuck was even worse. Yeah. 
You're right. Karina is just ahead of a Generation 2 gym leader. Bravo. My point, then, is that it seems like we have regressed. These leaders do the bare minimum to get by. Clement can technically deal with his ground-type weakness using Emolga's immunity and Heliolisk's Grass Knot. I also think it's clever to have Magneton use his sturdy ability to survive a ground-type attack and get off an electric terrain. But he can't actually put pressure on a ground-type. Neither can Emolga. It's built to Volt Switch, which it can't do against a ground-type. Basically, it's all up to Heliolisk, who will present a threat to a ground-type. But what about a Pokémon that knows a ground-type move? All it has is Thunderbolt, Quick Attack, and Grass Knot. For some reason, they all still have three moves again. I can't think of a leader in this game who could wall someone. Ramos can sort of deal with Fire-types, but not Flying or Poison-types. Valerie seems promising, covering her Fairy-type weaknesses. Mawile is immune to Poison and resists Steel, meaning you need Fire or Ground-type moves. Mr. Mime is part psychic type, meaning it can also put down poison types, but then it can't really attack steel types at all. So is it really keeping them at bay? Can she fire back with anything powerful of her own? Olympia can somewhat defend against ghost types and bug types, but it has no answer for dark types, which just so happens to be one of the most common attacking types. Seriously, what is Olympia going to do against a dark type? Slowking's going to use Power Gem? The less said about Wolfric, the better. But I think you see my point. Part of the reason I don't remember any of these characters is because they have given me no reason to remember them. You walk in, plow through them, and move on. Your regional decks may contribute to this as well, since you're regularly encountering strong options. You're practically given a Snorlax for free before the second gym, after the third gym, you're gifted a Mega Lucario. Seconds after that, you're gifted a Lapras. It is the largest regional decks filled to the brim with fan favorites. There are a multitude of options no matter where you look. In that way, I suppose you could say that previous games were more difficult due to their more limited options. It's nice to have so many choices when building a team, but I think even if you are building something intentionally weaker, there are concessions which nearly guarantee an easy playthrough. The new EXP share, which does not seem like it was built to accommodate players who explore every inch of these routes, will quickly rocket your levels into the stratosphere. I would personally take this over the mess of Gen 2 where grinding was a necessity, but it's still not ideal. Previous games had a pretty even spread of trainers for experience without feeling too overwhelming. There were enough things to see and do that you would naturally catch up to where you needed to be if you were interested in seeing everything. Here, it feels like you have to give up the alluring convenience of the EXP share, lest you condemn yourself to a journey where you do nothing but mash the A button. This is technically a trend Gen 5 started, but I do not like that gym leaders can use no more than three Pokémon. Their choices already aren't great, but there are a few instances where having just a few more slots would have made them feel more like boss fights. Instead, there are regular trainer battles you can stumble across that provoke more thought. The Elite Four in Champion Fight were the only battles I even remotely had trouble with. These fights take advantage of the expanded regional decks to bring some real heavy hitters. Malva has Pyroar and Chandelure as special attackers, Torkoal for bulk, and Talonflame for physical attacks. Wickstrom feels like a master of the Steel type, taking full advantage of its defensive strengths. Scizor and Aegislash are able to hit hard, with Klefki and Probopass taking a more supportive role. Drasna makes decent use of the dragon type, with Dragalgi there to deal with her fairy type weakness. Altaria, Noivern, and Dredagon are all pretty easy if you have a fairy or ice type, but at least they're competent choices that can hit pretty hard. Seabold's Gyarados and Starmie put in some work as well, even if Klotzer and Barbarical lag behind a bit. Diantha meets the bare minimum level of challenge one would expect of a champion, and that's about the best thing I can say about her. Aurorus and Gorgeist don't contribute very much, but hey, at least she actually Mega Evolves. It's astounding to me that Lysander and Diantha are the only two bosses that use Mega Evolution at all. The major new battle mechanic? Every gym leader should have Mega Evolved once you unlocked the ability. It would have made so much more sense. Give Ramos a Mega Venusaur, why not? Give Clement a Mega Ampharos, give Valerie a Mega Mawile, give Wolfric a Mega Abomasnow for Arceus's sake. 
you encounter in Obama Snow who gives you his Mega Stone. I don't think it would have been too much considering they seem to be bound by law to have no more than three Pokemon. It would have made for more memorable teams to go up against. My playthrough of Pokemon X was very boring, so much so that I needed to take another approach. I decided to do a Nuzlocke. Pokemon inherently allows for challenge runs of all shapes and sizes, ones that I've even covered in previous videos, but none are as popular as the Nuzlocke. It started with three simple rules. When one of your Pokemon faints, it is permanently gone. You cannot use it again. You can only catch the first Pokemon you encounter on a route, and you have to nickname every Pokemon you catch. A Nuzlocke is a complete transformation of a typical playthrough. You are not allowed to pre-build your team. It is chosen for you. Additionally, simple mistakes you could brush off in a normal game become life or death decisions. If you don't play optimally, you might lose your starter forever. I wanted to see if this would breathe some life into Kalos. I tried so hard to make these games difficult that I adopted some hardcore Nuzlocke rules. A level cap, which means my Pokemon can only ever be as high a level as the next gym leader's highest level, set mode, and no items in battle, like competitive, and the final twist, I could only bring as many Pokemon as the gym leader had. In this case, that was usually only three. I essentially cranked the dial as high as it could realistically go. Did this work? Was my playthrough more engaging? I'd say the first half of the adventure was a joke. Your chances of finding a good Pokemon are much higher on average. They gift you ones, like I previously mentioned, who will likely stay with you for a long time, and it almost certainly opens you up to a whole new universe of grinding if you want to be flexible with your choices. The hardest part was trying my best to avoid trainers so I didn't overlevel the next gym leader. I had a Drifblim and Azumarill for Karina, a Diggersby and Snorlax for Clement, I soloed Ramos with an Amolga, I remember trying to come up with mini challenges to prevent myself from getting bored, like going through the power plant without healing, but even that proved to be too easy. The times that I lost Pokemon were due to pure negligence. I lost a Pancham because I forgot it wasn't a dark type yet and couldn't actually tank a psychic move. I lost my Charmeleon because I was reading a text message and spamming the A button. Then, quite suddenly, things took a dark turn. I did not have any obvious answers to Valerie's team. I had bulldoze to deal with Mawile, but I had to wing everything else. This led to me losing my Azumarill and Driftblum. In retrospect, I think if I had played a little smarter, I could have gotten out of it unscathed. I thought this would be a simple bump in the road. Fairy is a new type, they made it decently strong, I simply didn't have any good counters to it. From here on, things would be fine. They were not fine. Valerie simply kicked the snowball down the mountain. It turns out, the rules I decided to use may have been too much for someone who has never finished a Nuzlocke. Despite exhausting all of my encounters, I somehow found myself almost losing to Lysander. I was in such a desperate situation that I elected to use Eveltal as a pick-me-up, though it didn't last long. Before I knew it, I had lost my run in Wolfric's gym. That's right, Wolfric. A certified joke of a leader. And it wasn't even him who did me in. It was one of his trainers, got me with two freezes in a row on two separate Pokemon, and whittled away at me until I was sent back to the Pokemon Center. According to the rules I was using, that meant it was over. I had lost my Nuzlocke. Now, I could blame that loss on negligence. I clearly underestimated how hard it would be, so I made some careless decisions in retrospect. However, the fact that making those decisions cost me so dearly in the end meant that the game was putting up enough resistance for my self-imposed challenge to do me in. This is why it's hard for me to parse discussions of difficulty in Pokemon. It is true that games like X and Y are much more forgiving. Objectively, and you know I hate that word, you can look at the teams you're up against and conclude that. It doesn't change the fact that your control over that difficulty is still as broad as it has ever been. I might not like that I have to work so hard to make these battles more engaging, but at least that is an option I have. It's also using the fundamental appeal of Pokemon. It isn't something as archaic as trying to beat a Mario game without the jump button. A Nuzlocke is quite literally abiding by the strengths of what makes Pokemon distinct. I suppose then, we need to ask a deeper question. Does Pokemon need to be difficult? I talk a lot in these videos about in-game teams and general difficulty, but to how many people does this actually matter? 
Pokemon may once have been about battling, but it has grown into something which can accommodate a varied set of interests. Some players are into the competitive battling side of things, and don't really care much for the casual playthrough. Some might be interested in completing the Pokedex, which can only be done after the credits roll. Some are going to hunker down for the next several months hunting for shinies. I know people who don't care whether the games are difficult, they're simply interested in meeting all the new Pokemon. For a lot of people, each new generation of Pokemon is about catching them all. It's an excuse you take every few years to go out and observe really cool creatures in their natural habitats. To a certain extent, I'm right there along with them. That is probably the biggest reason why I still play the games, despite how much they've changed. If I really wanted to, I could have given myself even stricter rules for my Nuzlocke. I could have banned gift Pokemon or lowered the level cap. Occasionally I'll see someone say that the popularity of Nuzlocke's is proof that the core games aren't hard enough, and that may be true, but the fact that Nuzlocke's exist at all is also proof that Pokemon has near limitless depth. The Nuzlocke that I did was itself a variant on the initial idea. There have been many others. Wedlocks, Egglocks, Wonderlocks, Monolocks, any of these rule sets could also be further changed to your liking. You could use Nuzlocke rules without adopting permadeath if you wanted to. What do all of these challenges have in common, though? No matter what rules you use, it is simply a different way to choose what ends up on your team of six. The core of Pokemon is just that malleable. That said, I don't think they should make them this easy. It's a little ridiculous how hard I had to work to give myself a reasonable challenge. And at the end of the day, the more work I have to put in, the less likely I'm going to be able to use Pokemon I care about. You really have to scrape the bottom of the barrel in X and Y if you want a more satisfying battle experience in a way that you never had to do previously. It's yet another symptom of an overarching problem, one which is about to become a theme. Time for new legends in Pokemon X and Pokemon Y. Explore an exciting new region filled with new Pokemon to catch and train. And meet some Pokemon making their return with all new powers. It's time for Pokemon X and Y. Out October 12th, exclusive to the Nintendo 3DS family. Nothing exemplifies the phrase going through the motions quite like X and Y do. It is a standard Pokemon adventure. The premise is similar to Black and White. You and your friends are going on a Pokemon journey, except this time you have four friends instead of two. You have your gendered rival, Shauna is your friendly rival who doesn't end up fit for battling, Tierno is... I guess another friendly rival who likes to dance. There's another one, but I couldn't tell you his name. They suck. A lot. Like, they're bad. What made Sharon and Bianca compelling was that they went through character arcs. Like everyone else in that region, they were searching for what their purpose was, what their relationship with their Pokemon meant to them. None of these friends have anything like that. Your standard rival somehow has even less personality than Brendan or May, which is an impressive feat. You share a cute moment with Shauna watching the fireworks, and from there I couldn't tell you what she even wants. She sort of struggles to find her purpose, like Bianca does, but her ending basically amounts to she had fun seeing the sights. Tierno is probably the most unique rival, building his team around a dance theme, but that's as far as it will ever go with him. That's as far as it ever goes with any of them, yet they hog up a ton of screen time. Early on, you're going to be assaulted by these bastards, eager to show up and enjoy the adventure with you. Except, they have nothing interesting going for them, so they exist solely as tutorial vessels. They're part of the reason it takes so long to get from the first gym badge to the second gym badge. You spend so much time chasing down this furfru, watching the fireworks, meeting up with your buddies, battling their pathetic teams, chasing down Team Flare. Then, from badges 2 to 7, they vanish for a while, showing up in brief spurts as you tear through the rest of the region in record time. Masuda said that in his experience, middle school students in Japan are absorbed in so many other things. In order to adapt their shrinking free time, Pokemon should become something with a brisk, easygoing pace. Boy oh boy did they accomplish that with X and Y. I think this change in philosophy resulted in a few good things. I actually like the idea of the revamped EXP share. I prefer to spend more time assembling my team and less time training it. 
It also means there's less time devoted to the evil team storyline, which is a good thing, because X and Y's take on that idea is extremely underwhelming. Team of Flare, the team who wants to make the world more beautiful. To achieve this, they will use the 3,000 year old super weapon to blow up the world. I should say at the outset that I don't have a problem with an evil team that errs more on the side of Team Rocket, a group of troublemakers you aren't meant to take seriously. I don't think every Pokemon game needs to be trying for something as high concept as black and white. That said, X and Y are still clearly trying to be that. Lysander doesn't want to blow up the world for the fun of it, he's doing it because he's disgusted with the impurities of humanity. How did he find himself on that path? Well, all we really know is that he used to help people on his travels, but that they would ask too much of him. Because of this, he decided blowing up the world would be the next best course of action. It's funny reading this entry on his wiki page, that is quite literally all we know about his motivations. He's the most obvious twist villain ever created. I think maybe the second thing he ever says to you is that the world is ugly and he'd just love to make the world more beautiful in his image. All anyone ever says about him is that he's a great man. Out of nowhere, he contacts you and tells you he's gonna destroy the world now, with the reason being that he wants to test your resolve. Funny that he cares so much for someone who won't exist in the next couple hours. His reasoning for annihilating all life is that he thinks humans are inherently greedy, that they are destined to use Pokemon as tools. But, get this, even though he thinks Pokemon are beautiful creatures, because humans are fated to abuse them, he thinks it best to completely eradicate all Pokemon. Okay, I can't look at him as anything other than a failed attempt at trying to do Cyrus again. There's even an NPC in Snowbell City who says Lysander had noble intentions or some trite, just like Cyrus's grandparents in Sunnyshore, except the reason Cyrus worked is because his mindset actually made sense. He was a sociopath. His model for an ideal world was one without emotions. He prized his intellect above the bonds he shared, had more of a relationship with his machines than anyone around him, and sought to recreate the world in his cold image. He was a false god in the region where the world was created, and his downfall was the antithesis of what the Sinnoh games were about, connection. I don't know what Lysander is supposed to represent. It is never made very clear whether he wants to wipe himself out with the world or not. In X, he has a line where he wants to force immortality on himself and the player, implying that he intends to persist beyond the destruction of the world. In Y, however, as Bulbapedia amusingly puts it, he intends to kill everyone in the building, which surely also means himself. Either way, even if he and Team Flare do persist beyond the destruction of the world, somehow, it is not the same situation as Cyrus. Xerneas and Eviltal do not have the power to recreate the world. Lysander's vision of a more beautiful world, then, is one that no longer exists. I suppose you could say his faith in humanity is non-existent that he is the ultimate pessimist. But I don't know, it all feels like a very weak justification to have an end of the world plot. It is also very strange that so many people treat this maniac with kid gloves. Your rival seems to think he's just a little bit misguided. Maybe if he had some friends. Bro, this dude wants to nuke the world. It also feels like it doesn't really slot in very well with the story of AZ and the Floette. It's through him that we learn of a war which raged 3,000 years ago. The superweapon itself is the embodiment of the dichotomy between Xerneas and Eviltal, destruction and creation. It was created to resurrect Floette, who was sacrificed during the war. In his anger, he then turned that weapon on the war itself, nuking the battleground and effectively ending the war. This superweapon absorbed the life energy of surrounding Pokémon as its power source, effectively making AZ no better than the people he was so angry with. Floette, realizing this, left him. Once you deal with Team Flare and Lysander dies with his superweapon, you don't really touch on any of that stuff again. Oh yeah, I was doing a League challenge. You finish the game, beat Diantha, all that. And then, during the parade you attend, AZ shows up for a battle out of nowhere, reunites with his Floette, all's well that ends well, except for the fact that AZ is still barely even a character at this point. Maybe Lysander is following in the footsteps of AZ, consumed by his anger towards the ugly side of human nature, so much so that he unknowingly becomes ugly himself. Is this a story about how the beauty of life is easily corrupted? Ultimately, even if this was the intent, 
I find what it has to say about human nature to be very vapid. It all amounts to, we should be nice to each other and be friends, and also you should have empathy for those who want to commit war crimes. Yes, this is a game for children, I don't expect it to go the extra mile and dissect the horrors of war. Nevertheless, I do think the series has shown an ability to convey more varied messages. Black and White was able to teach people to think for themselves, to see past manipulators and propagandists, Platinum was able to rise past the philosophy of nihilism, refuting it by celebrating the power of being connected with the world and with others. Pokemon has done better than this. There's a very surface level examination of royalty and the ruling class, which basically amounts to making fun of rich people. And hey, I'm not against making fun of rich people. It is quite funny to me that it seems one of Game Freak's takeaways from visiting France is that rich people are pompous assholes. I thought they were going to lean into Lysander's status as a CEO of a tech company more prominently. There's a reading of him that could be emblematic of figures like Elon Musk. Idiots who think that through their alleged genius and entrepreneurship, they can make the world a better place while they slowly burn it to the ground. It's hard to view Lysander through this lens when the narrative is so concerned with trying to make him an empathetic figure. His presence as a CEO is secondary. There's a world where this story was a little bit less high stakes. Perhaps Lysander's goal could have been to solve an energy crisis by using his technology. His attempts to make the world more beautiful will have been achieved at the top of a corporate hierarchy which exploits the world's natural resources to exist in the first place, making him his own worst enemy. Oh, wait a minute. I may have just had an epiphany. What we get out of X and Y is nothing as salient as that. Instead, it's a bog-standard end-of-the-world plot that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and takes up a big chunk of time for no reason other than they needed to involve the legendaries in a big boss fight before going back to the League Challenge. Remember when Ho-Oh and Lugia weren't part of the evil team's plan? When they were simply hidden away from the rest of the world and you had to go find them? Now, it's a foregone conclusion that you're going to encounter the legendaries. That sense of wonder has been decimated by the need to make them such a core part of the narrative. I think Xerneas and Eveltal would have been so much more interesting if they weren't part of the Team Flare plot. They're crowbarred into it with all the grace of a Magikarp out of water. While Gen 3 may have started the trend of involving the legendaries more closely, at least they felt like they reflected the thematic core of the region. Gen 3 had a strong climate change bend. Gen 4 had a very ancient feeling on account of it being this world's creation myth. Gen 5 was an interpersonal clash between truth and ideals, with its legends meant to reflect that struggle. Xerneas and Iveltal represent life and death. That's really all they are. I suppose their cyclical nature is symbolic of one thing, the point at which Pokemon fell into a familiar, safe rhythm. They represent the inevitable push and pull of a franchise under capitalism, and beg the question, what is Pokemon's shelf life? It's no secret that X and Y were rushed. It's no secret that earlier Pokemon games were rushed. I don't think it should be a secret that Game Freak are on a nightmarish timetable. In order to simply get a game out for the sixth generation, they had to tread familiar ground. Frankly, it's a miracle black and white turned out the way they did in retrospect. When you are the only thing holding back a flood of new merchandise, shows, movies, etc., there is no time to think about what's best for the game itself. There's no time to put further consideration into what your story is trying to say. There is only time to put out a functional product that will allow for more money to be made in a timely fashion. It's been speculated that a lot was left on the cutting room floor during X and Y's development. Talks of the game originally being about an alien invasion. AZ would have been one of those aliens, and the pieces of his ship would have become the Megastones. Team Flare would have been a Men in Black style organization hunting down AZ, and Looker would have been much more involved. It was also meant to explain where the mysterious new fairy type came from. Fairy types would have been aliens that came to the planet thousands of years ago alongside characters like AZ and Diantha, which would help explain why so many old Pokemon were suddenly given the new type. There were reports of Lysander and Sycamore once being the same character, a Jekyll and Hyde-esque personality split. All of this was leaked on 4chan shortly after the release of X and Y. Seeing as a lot of this went on to inform the Gen 3 remakes and Gen 7, I'm going to take this poster at their word. It might not be true, but I'm inclined to believe that Gen 6 was not meant to turn out this boring. Let's say that somewhere along the way, they decided these ideas were too outlandish and complicated and wanted to dedicate the majority of their remaining time to Pokemon models. 
When you're on such a short timetable, throwing away ideas like this does not mean you get to make up that time later. In deciding to take a more mystical approach, as the leak states, you now need to come up with something to take its place. It makes sense to me that they ended up with what feels like a rough draft, because that's probably all they could come up with in the time they had. If we look back at the jump from Diamond and Pearl to Platinum, there were clearly similar problems going on with the rough drafts of those games as well. Look at Sky Battles. What even are Sky Battles? Battles you can only partake in with Pokémon that can fly. That is all they are. What was the reason for this? Was it, perhaps, an extremely half-baked idea meant to fill in the gaps left by the stuff they needed to scrap? I don't have the answers, but it seems fairly likely. Occasionally, Pokémon will incorporate random stuff like this, which feels like the development team throwing ideas at the wall. Since they have no time to reconsider what it adds, though, it just stays stuck on the wall. Do you remember inverse battles, the thing you can do in one house against one trainer? Here, tight matchups are reversed. It's a cool idea, but it feels like it's in here accidentally. I wouldn't be surprised if their mentality was to save a redraft for an eventual Pokémon Z. Much like Giratina in Diamond and Pearl, Zygarde sits in Terminus Cave during the postgame for you to catch. It doesn't even look like it belongs here. Its Pokédex entry states that it is the protector of the ecosystem. I suppose it's meant to step in when the natural balance between life and death is disrupted. Or at least, I think this is the idea. It exists as one of the two things you can even do in the postgame. One of those things involves walking into a cave that looks suspiciously like Cerulean Cave and catching a Mewtwo. You know, if they were so interested in recapturing Red and Blue, maybe they should have just made those games again. There is nothing to do in the postgame. You collect Mega Stones, fight in this game's equivalent of the Battle Tower, find one of the Kanto legendary birds, and that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, you can also battle your rival. This time they Mega Evolve their Absol. Cute. The Battle Maison is realistically all you'll be doing. The Shadow Lanes are kinda neat, especially in the Super Battles format. It's where they stuffed all the legendaries you can't catch. There aren't even any new legendaries to catch, it's just Zygarde and one of the Kanto birds. It is so clear to me that a Pokemon Z was planned. Who knows what it would have done, but if it was anything like the Gen 4 jump, we may have seen a Kalos that was much more interesting. There's an argument to be made that Game Freak's priorities for Pokemon have shifted as the years have gone on. There seems to be a belief over there that the attention span of children these days is lesser, and that there doesn't need to be a big post-game. This was a huge point of contention when the Battle Frontier wasn't included in the Gen 3 remakes. People were not happy with the reason given. Masuda stated that the Battle Frontier wasn't included because most players wouldn't engage with something that challenging. Essentially, it was seen as a waste of development resources. Now, on the face of it, that seems silly, right? So many people talk about how cool the Battle Frontier was. So, putting myself in their shoes for a second, why did the team have to ask themselves questions like these in the first place? Game Freak did not have a problem including an expansive post-game in Gen 5. Why is that? How did we go from that to nothing? Simple. Game Freak had to ask themselves what was necessary to include. They jumped straight onto the 3D train and had to make sacrifices. The post-game is a quick sacrifice to make because it's something only people who stick it through to the end are even going to experience. A lot of people look at X and Y as a shift in philosophy. This is when Game Freak began valuing challenge less. This is when they started putting less content into their games. But ask yourselves, why did they have to do that in the first place? Why did stuff end up on the chopping block? X and Y was a turning point. This was when the unstoppable force slammed into the immovable object. And it sold a little better than black and white. You know, that game, that generation they clearly poured their hearts and souls into. It got outsold by a half-finished, half-gutted mess built to grab the attention of older fans. I can't begin to imagine what it's like to work at Game Freak. Maybe this didn't bother them at all. Maybe they're just happy to make Pokemon games, to be the kingmakers that usher in a new generation of endlessly marketable creatures. Maybe they see themselves as superstars. But if I were them, I think I'd be crushed by that. Crushed by the realization that Pokemon is so, so much bigger than the people who keep it running. That it doesn't even matter what you do with these games, what they leave behind. All that matters is that they come out regularly so that the Empire of Gold can continue to glisten. 
Generation 6 was the first time I had to grapple with Pokemon's seat on the capitalistic throne. It was when the seed of questions I'd never asked myself before took root. How long can this go on? How long do I want it to go on? Does Pokemon itself need to evolve?